Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for another uh, Ariopa webinar. Uh, today's topic is working with APIs, and uh, we've got Aaron Jan Kaufman uh, presenting for us today. Uh, he's a man who probably doesn't need much introduction to uh, our community, but he's a freelance uh, consultant and trainer, uh, fresh from presenting for us at NAV Tech Days and he'll be taking us through this subject today. Uh, my name is James Pearson, and I will be your moderator. Um, so any questions that you have, uh, post those in the question window, and uh, we'll try and have some time to get to those at the end. Uh, so your microphone is muted, but uh, feel free to post a question, and uh, I'll pick that up and uh, relay that to AJ as appropriate. Um, YouTube channel for Ariopa webinars, which um, is building up a nice library of content now. So uh, please go and subscribe to that channel if you're interested in this sort of content. Uh, this session and future sessions will be uploaded to the channel as well. So have a look at that. Um, and there's the, the links, there's a, a newsletter, and uh, the website where you can see details of webinars that are coming up. There is one planned for December, uh, another session on uh, Docker dynamic scaling uh, containers on Docker Swarm. Uh, so that will be uh, on December the 10th. And um, Luke has put the call out uh, looking for more speakers and topics. So feel free to uh, suggest one that you'd like to hear or that you'd like to present yourself. Uh, with that, that's enough from me. Uh, thanks to 4Nav who sponsor these webinars. And uh, let's hand over to AJ now. So, um, AJ, I'm handing over control to you now. Okay. Then I think you should now see my screen. Yep, got you. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, webinar about uh, APIs. Uh, thanks, uh, James, for introducing me, and thanks, Luke, for organizing uh, this webinar and uh, allowing me to, uh, to present this topic. Um, very short introduction from my side. Uh, I, I, yeah, like James said, I'm a freelance consultant trainer uh, in the Dynamics uh, Business Central, NavWorld. Uh, I, I, I'm in this industry since 2002, so uh, I've seen, uh, I think, uh, quite a lot in the, in the time. Um, and yeah, at the moment, uh, my, my main focus is on, uh, on Business Central, AL development, workshops, uh, coaching partners, um, and kind of a specialization on, on APIs, uh, uh, power Automate, uh, Power Apps, and, and stuff like that. So, which, which, which is all related to APIs anyway. So that's for introduction. Um, I want to take you today with um, uh, in in the world of uh, of APIs. And uh, honestly, uh, I think one hour is just not enough to uh, to get you through because. Uh, I had to make decisions on topics that I cannot touch today, but feel free to, to ask any questions uh, if you may have and or reach out after the uh, session. You see my uh, uh, contact details here on the screen, so uh, feel free to, to contact me if you have any further questions or want to, to hear about a uh, specific topic that I couldn't uh, cover today. Um, so let's see. Uh, how does this work? I want to go to the next slide. Yeah, there we go. So, um, yeah, you probably are uh, already used or know that uh, we do have um, uh, page web services in Dynamics Nav, and uh, we still do them uh, do have them in in Business Central. Um, but a couple of years ago, I don't know exactly what's that to one year, two years ago, we got uh, API functionality in Business Central. So I think, uh, also based on questions I get sometimes, I think it's it's, it's a good idea to first uh, uh, compare it to the page-based uh, based web services. 
Uh, standard APIs that we uh, have now in uh, in Business Central, they uh, are standard across tenants, which means that Microsoft um, makes sure that uh, those uh, APIs are always the same and uh, you cannot uh, change them, uh, where um, the, the page-based web services are tenant-specific, can be uh, disabled per tenant, uh, can be extended, can be modified, etc. Um, if you compare it uh, to uh, uh, um, the fields that are exposed by the standard APIs, then uh, the, the fields that you have in the standard APIs compared to page-based web services is that uh, in the APIs, they are really uh, designed to align with uh, what, an, uh, what you can expect from an ERP uh, a solution like Business Central, while on the page web services, yeah, you expose a page, including all the fields, uh, nobody really thought about it, uh, what exactly should be on that page or not. So uh, for the APIs, that is really a, a, a I could say, almost hand-picked set of fields that uh, you would expect to be exposed by, uh, by an, uh, a world-class ERP system. The APIs uh, uh, return that data in the OData v4 format, while the uh, page web services uh, can also deliver it with uh, OData uh, v3 or uh, even with SOAP. Um, at the end of presentation, I uh, hope to uh, convince you that, uh, that SOAP is not needed anymore. We can all go with uh, REST web services and OData uh, anyway, even with, uh, with code units. Um, the standard APIs uh, can be created with extensions, as you will see later, in, in custom APIs uh, where with page type or query type is, is API, and the page uh, web services are, uh, again, pages and queries, but also code units. Um, so what is a very important difference between APIs and page web services is uh, the, the versioning. Uh, standard APIs uh, are delivered as versions. Um, so part of the URL is a version and the page web services do not work with versions anyway. So uh, there it's just what is in the database, that is what you get. While with the APIs, uh, you have a fixed contract on a certain uh, version and uh, a new version also requires a uh, modification to the URL. So um, uh, you can uh, switch to a new URL as you are ready for it. The standard APIs uh, support webhooks while the page web services don't support webhooks. Now webhook is one of the uh, uh, less known um, uh, and less used uh, uh, features of, of web services, and uh, I'm afraid there's not too much time in this webinar to go deep down in, into webhooks unless uh, you want to ask questions about it, and I would be happy to take them at the end. Uh, APIs are installed as an extension, and uh, that is something I'm going to show you that the APIs currently uh, in uh, the standard APIs are installed as, a, as an extension and not part of the base application. While um, uh, with the uh, page web services, you have to configure them, uh, configure them uh, yourself in the page uh, uh, in the web services page, where you can see the complete list of uh, exposed web services. That is not the case with standard APIs. They uh, and also custom APIs, by the way, you install them as an extension. Um, an important uh, difference is the namespace support, the APIs that you create uh, uh, or use uh, from the standard APIs or your custom APIs, they do have namespaces. Um, so every uh, extension can use its own namespace, which becomes part of the URL, as you will see later. Um, with the uh, page web services, uh, it's that's not possible. Um, standard APIs do not support extensibility that's prohibited uh, with the page web services that is possible with a page extension. And the standard APIs uh, support bound actions um, and no unbound actions. And what are different exactly is, uh, is something I will explain uh, at the very end of this uh, presentation, because that is a less known feature, but a very powerful feature, uh, bound and unbound actions. 
uh, and I also show you how to use unbound actions in combination with code units uh, exposed as a web service. So um, let's start with the basic of API. So every uh, API on Business Central, and I'm not talking about the Business Central cloud uh, environment, uh, obviously, uh, it starts with uh, HTTPS api.businesscentral.dynamics.com. Then after that host name, uh, you can uh, specify uh, version one or version two. Now the V1 is the, uh, the, the previous endpoint. It's still uh, working, but I, I think it's gonna be duplicated uh, uh, next year. It is an endpoint that does not support uh, named environments, which means that uh, uh, in your uh, URL, uh, if you do not specify an environment, name it's considered to be a production environment and if you uh, specify an environment name it can only be sandbox so um, the the currently the uh, possibility to have named uh, sandboxes or named environments also production environments can be named differently uh, it's only supported with the v2 endpoint so that's the the, the first version you see in the url uh, after the uh, businesscentral.dynamics.com, you say slash v2, which you should do, and then uh, you specify your tenant. Uh, with tenant, we mean uh, the Azure Active Directory tenant, uh, which can be a GUID, but it's more uh, useful to give that a name, like um, uh, your, your email domain name that is uh, used for Azure Active Directory. You will see a couple of, of demos later on where I'm, I'm using that. And then slash environment slash API. That is the complete based uh, URL. Um, and uh, if we talk about that, that, that little single, uh, that little part tenant in the URL, uh, it's even uh, the case that uh, you can leave out the tenant name uh, if you authenticate as a OAuth user, meaning that um, uh, the system can already identify you as a tenant user. In that case, you can completely leave out the tenant and only specify the environment. <coughs> Now, after the API, uh, after that, that API part of the URL, um, you can specify either beta or v1, v1.0. The, uh, the, the beta API is live in the system until April 2020, and the v1 API is live since April 2019. And that is something you will see in the URL as well. So that's the second uh, version you will see in the URL, um, that is API slash beta or API slash V1. So in, in total, we have two versions in, uh, in our URL. The first one uh, uh, points to uh, the endpoint that supports named uh, environments, named sandboxes. And uh, the second uh, version reflects to which version of the URL, of which version of the API do you want to call? So um, APIs um, of the beta version is part of the uh, base application. Uh, here on the screen, you see a screenshot of uh, the complete base application. Um, where I have uh, tried to, to find all uh, pages with PageSype API. Um, you see 49 uh, files, and those uh, 49 files uh, are in the base application. So um, uh, the beta version is in the, in, uh, inside the base application. As you can see, um, uh, there is, is, is no version at all in uh, in the page, when you see all those properties with entity name, entity set name, etc., um, there is no um, uh, version information whatsoever. Uh, and if there is no version information, then it's considered to be a beta API. If we compare it to the version one, the version one is uh, installed as an app, and it is installed as a hidden app. So um, uh, it to, to view the source code of that app, uh, you have to, to, to get 
uh, the, um, uh, the app file that belongs to that underscore exclude underscore API v1 uh, app that is installed, something that you won't see on the extension management page, but you can uh, set uh, a dependency on it, or you can use a, a sandbox container uh, to um, uh, to get the app file and extract the app file, and that will give you the complete source code of the uh, API v1 um, version. Uh, which I think is useful. Sometimes I, I look into it. I cannot change it. Those uh, API files uh, do have uh, extensibility set to false. You cannot uh, add a page extension on top of it, but you can learn from it. You can also, uh, sometimes you just need to find out how uh, do things work. So uh, I think uh, this is very useful to, to get your hands on, uh, on the source code. So before I start with some demos, I want to give you uh, a couple of OData tips um, because Microsoft uh, is not just exposing uh, uh, APIs. They are following the OData uh, uh, specification. And uh, the first thing you should know is uh, the basic operations. Um, if you want to, uh, uh, to list a, a collection, then you use the HTTP method get, um, and then uh, on your endpoint, for example, you do then uh, the complete URL and then slash items and that, or uh, slash customers or slash uh, sales orders or whatever uh, collection you want to, uh, to call, and then you get uh, the complete collection. Now with um, that collection, you can also get a member of the collection. And that's done with um, uh, the uh, brackets, uh, and between the brackets you specify the ID of uh, that particular record, which is uh, currently the, uh, the system ID. If you want to create a new record, then you use the HTTP method post on the same uh, endpoint as you use for list. So uh, you create a new item in the collection. And of course, uh, you have to specify some more information because with post, you're sending information to the server. Um, uh, if you compare that to uh, filling in a form in, in a browser with name, address, and then click on submit, then you are also posting information. Um, this is similar. Uh, you have to, uh, uh, to post uh, a JSON that represents the, uh, the item that you want to create. Now, if you want to update an existing item, you use the same uh, as get a member of the collection, uh, the same URL, but now not with the get, but with the patch command. So that will update the item. Same goes for delete. Uh, you cannot delete a complete collection. You delete a single item in the collection, and uh, you do that with the delete command on a particular uh, member of the collection. Then you have the um, uh, invoke uh, method, um, and that is um, on a particular item in the collection, not on the collection itself, but always a particular item. You can do that with a uh, slash and then the, um, the bound action. A bound action is something that is bound to a specific uh, item in the, in the collection. That's why it is called a bound action. Um, so um, you will see the complete structure uh, in an example later on. Um, but bound actions is actually calling uh, uh, an, uh, a function that then uh, can do something on this particular record. So um, uh, it, 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 in the function, you have the record and you can just write AL code uh, to, to do whatever uh, action you want to, to, to execute. Then there is an, uh, another one that is l uh, not really uh, well known, and uh, that is executing multiple requests with the dollar batch command, uh, something that uh, I'm afraid we will not cover today, but maybe in, in another way we are. But um, this allows you to uh, basically allows you to uh, to send in a multiple request at the same time. Uh, and uh, get a, get multiple uh, results back from uh, from that uh, request. It can save you a number of calls, of course. Uh, it can save you time. It can minimize the, um, uh, the 
round time, it can minimize the, uh, the data that goes over the wire, etc. So there's definitely something to look into if you, uh, if, if you have a solution that requires to, uh, to call multiple requests, to do multiple requests in a row, then uh, it might be an idea to work with the dollar batch uh, endpoint. Another thing to know is the, the, the query parameters, and I will uh, also demonstrate some of them. Um, the query parameters is um, uh, the, the dollar filter, um, which completely follows the, um, uh, the, the OData standards, and um, that, with that you can uh, place filters on the, on the collection. Uh, the dollar select uh, allows you to uh, to tell the server which fields you want to get in your result. So if you uh, are only interested in a few fields, you should consider to use the dollar select um, uh, to uh, to minimize the data that goes over the wire, uh, have a, a faster result, etc. You can use an order by to, to get your result ordered by a, a specific field. Uh, with the dollar top and dollar skip, uh, you can use paging. So uh, with the dollar top, uh, you specify how many uh, uh, line, how, how many rows or records you want to, uh, to get in the result. And with skip, you can specify how many records you want to skip and then well, combined with top, uh, you can uh, really implement paging on, uh, uh, on the APIs. Uh, you can uh, expand uh, related resources. So for example, sales orders, uh, does have a sales order lines. Um, you don't have to call sales order lines uh, separately. With dollar expand sales order lines, it will uh, uh, give you header and lines in one go. Uh, which of course uh, saves you one extra call. Um, you also can do um, uh, dollar count, uh, uh, which will return uh, the list of uh, uh, of entries instead of the the complete collection. You get the number of of items in that collection. So. Um, what I will do is to do a short demo on uh, on standard APIs. Um, for that, I will be using um, uh, the REST client in, in VS Code. Uh, it could also be Postman. Um, uh, I, I'm well actually a fan of, of, of the REST client in, uh, in VS Code. Uh, if you don't know which one that is, uh, you can just uh, find it with REST client. It's this one. Uh, the REST client and install that um, and it will work right away. You create a, a file uh, with uh, .http uh, and then uh, you can type in uh, URLs. In this case, uh, I have already set some, some variables in my environment with a username and a password, um, which I will show you in a second. Uh, so uh, it, it really makes uh, for a clean interface. If you type in a, um, uh, a command get and then the URL, you get a send request button uh, on the top of it. And if you want to have multiple uh, uh, requests, you have to uh, specify, it will write to type in at least three hashtags, uh, which will then separate uh, requests uh, from each other. Uh, in my case, what I've done, um, uh, I've uh, created a, a setting here in my settings file where I have set uh, the, some environment variables. I've set some for the sandbox, my local Docker, uh, some for the cloud, uh, where I have typed in my username and my web service access key. Um, I hope you know what a web service access key is. Uh, if not, uh, I would be happy to uh, take a question on that later. Um, and I type in also the base URL so I can reuse it everywhere. Um, and of course, I could also specify these uh, variables in top of uh, this HTTP file. But this setting it in the in the settings file allows me to quickly switch between sandbox and cloud 
um, uh, this is, you know, it takes you from the settings file, so uh, I can uh, quickly switch between uh, online and, uh, and my local Docker sandbox to do some tests. Um, another uh, setting that I use for the REST client, for those that are uh, already familiar with that, uh, with that tool, uh, I have set the preview option to exchange. The question I get sometimes is, uh, I can with the REST client see uh, what, uh, what the result is, um, but I don't see um, uh, what, um, uh, what, what the request is. So let me show the difference from that. I've now set it to the standard uh, uh, default um, uh, setting. I click on this send request and I get back the complete result. In this case, uh, just a list of available standard APIs. So when you top, you see here uh, the headers the, uh, from the uh, response and here you see the uh, response body. Now, a question that I get sometimes is, hey, what is now exactly uh, the, uh, the, the request as it uh, was sent? And if you want to see that, uh, you have to set this to uh, the preview option to exchange. And if you then click on send request, you get in the top also the complete get command. So you can see what is the, um, uh, the headers that you send, authorization, accept encoding, et cetera. And, and then here I have my response. So that is a very useful tool to, to completely um, inspect your uh, request and response. So um, this is the list of, um, of APIs, APIs that are also um, uh, documented by Microsoft. Now, every um, uh, API that you see here at the endpoint uh, uh, can be called by adding it to the end of the URL, but not directly. If, if I would, uh, for example, take uh, employees here and add it to uh, the end of the URL, and I'm gonna send request again, it will say, sorry, I cannot do this um, uh, because you have no default company. So uh, companies must be your first part of the URL because every endpoint is in fact bound to a company. So that's the uh, first thing uh, you always have to do is to find, to get the, um, um, uh, the company ID, which I've done here. And this is now my company uh, that I want to work with. So if I do this, this is a collection. And if I do this, uh, I get that single record in the, um, in, in the result. Now with uh, the REST client, what I can do is uh, also set a variable. Um, I have named this request companies uh, with this uh, line. And here uh, I, have, uh, I get from the companies, from the complete response, so from this part, I get the body and then uh, the first value, which uh, represents uh, this one in the array value. Uh, and from that one, the ID. So um, automatically my CID parameter, you see here, my variable is now containing for the rest of all my requests, the um, ID of this company. Now let's, let's get the items. And uh, if I click on that one, I get a complete uh, uh, list of all items that are available in, uh, uh, in this company. Uh, uh, for, um, uh, for on, on this tenant, you see my, my tenant name is here specified as kaufman.nl uh, and my uh, environment is specified as demo. So um, I get a complete list of everything. Now what I can do is uh, to select only some properties instead of getting the complete information. Maybe I'm only interested in the ID, uh, the item number, uh, the name and inventory. So if I add that as a dollar select and uh, I click on uh, send request, you see it's, it's shortened. I only get back the, uh, the well, those fields, those uh, uh, columns that I'm interested in. What I also can do is instead of um, uh, getting a specific list of um, a specific list of, of fields, I can also specify one single field, as you see here, 
and say, give me only the inventory for this particular item. And this item ID that you see here is uh, so pointing to only this item. So if I would remove this for a moment, then you would see that it gets only this, uh, uh, this item. And if I uh, add inventory to the end of it, I only get this one. So if I do send request, then it says the value of uh, inventory is four. I even can, uh, can get the raw uh, value of, uh, of this field by adding dollar value to it. So do I send request and only get back as a result four. With, um, and have, uh, yeah, you have, have a look at this one here in the top, the header, it says text plain. Um, and if I do this one, it says uh, content type is application JSON. So um, with uh, this set request, uh, it really makes sense to, um, uh, to get only one value back, minimizing uh, the load on, uh, on the wire, of course. Uh, let's also do some, uh, um, uh, some filtering. So here uh, I'm going to filter on a display name equals, uh, that's the EQ equals, and then uh, chair with uh, some wildcards around it. And this will give me all chairs, um, uh, the, the, the Paris guest chair, uh, London swivel chair, etc. And if I even combine that, with that select. So I use the uh, ampersand uh, here and then do that uh, same thing as here in the top, select only those, uh, those fields. Then I get even a smaller list uh, back uh, and only have this, uh, the chair items. So I, I think that really makes sense to work with these kind of uh, opportunities. Another possibility is to modify uh, items. So um, let's have a look at um, uh, one of these items. Um, let's take uh, uh, this one here. Uh, this item has at this moment an inventory of zero. Now, if I want to modify that inventory, I can send a patch command to this particular item and um, say, I want to have an inventory of, uh, let's say it's gonna be 25. Now, if I call this, uh, you will see that I will get an error message. And uh, the error message, it said it could not validate the client concurrency token. Uh, this is because the API implements concurrency like another user uh, has modified your record. So um, uh, if you, read a record, you get in uh, an OData e-tag, which is this one, which represents the version of the record. And you have to add that into the if match header um, and then put it in here, uh, remove that uh, slash because that's uh, um, uh, escape character for the double quote. And now if I call this one, it will, it's now waiting, you can see it here on the bottom. And there it is, um, inventory for this item is now 25. Now, this if match can be uh, bypassed in case you uh, do not want to, to check on uh, current versions and you think, well, uh, I don't care or if I have a scenario where I don't need, uh, uh, don't have to be afraid that somebody else could uh, change the record in between, then you could also say if match is wildcard and uh, do it like this and I'll send request say it should be 30 and there you have the results inventory is now 30. So that also really works. Um, let's have a look at uh, another endpoint. This is employees. I have a, a, a list of employees here. And um, with this one, I can also uh, do, and, and other ones as well, I can expand uh, the, um, uh, in this case, the default dimensions. It's, it's part of, of this uh, endpoint. So if I click on expand, you'll see default dimensions here is empty. The default dimension for this employee is set to department is ADM. And here we have uh, 
uh, another one with uh, empty dimensions. Here we have another one. And here we have a uh, department plot. So uh, it, it adds this default dimensions to the uh, result, which also works on sales orders and sales order lines, etc. Creating a new employee uh, is done with uh, uh, this in this way. Uh, and this also works on items. It works on, on and any other uh, API endpoint. This is just an example. If I want to uh, to create a new employee, I send in a given name, a surname, which I took from uh, this uh, example here. Uh, I could also try display name, but that will give me an error message because display name is is not editable. Uh, well, that's of course the implementation of the of the API. You need to get used to that, uh, uh, try out and to read documentation as with any API. Um, you need to know what exactly what you what you are doing, of course. Um, so um, another example that I want to show you is the is the bound actions. Also talked about that. Uh, if I get sales orders, and let me uh, also go to um, uh, Business Central here. Let me zoom in a little bit and say sales orders. Um, we're going to post uh, a sales order. Uh, let's take, come on, you can enlarge that. Let's take uh, number uh, uh, 101002. Uh, I want to post that with an, uh, with an API, uh, with an API call. So I get my orders here. Here I have this, this number. I take this uh, ID and then on uh, this URL that you see here, let me just click this away. Uh, you see here um, uh, the complete URL that I need to call this uh, ship and invoice function. It's on uh, one of the slides later on where you will see that, uh, uh, that function, how that looks like. But if I uh, uh, click on, uh, on send request, then it takes a moment and then it will give me no result, as in uh, 204, no content. 204 means no content, but 204 is a success code because it's it, it's in the 200 range. And if I look onto this here, I do F5, you see that number two is gone and I only have number three and four. So with an API call, I have now posted this, um, uh, this, uh, this sales order. Um, and that's just by uh, doing it on the endpoint of the particular uh, record, followed by Microsoft.nav, not BC, by the way, and the uh, .ship and invoice. Okay, I will come back to that uh, bound action uh, later on. Uh, for the next couple of minutes, I want to talk uh, about custom APIs. Um, what can we do with custom APIs? Um, we can, uh, it, well, custom APIs can be developed by anyone. Uh, they, they can be included in your add-on apps. Uh, you access them with uh, specific endpoints that you decide on, on how those endpoints will uh, uh, be composed. And they're quite easy to create. Now, just a couple of uh, uh, API considerations. Uh, Microsoft makes sure all their APIs are consistent. Uh, to make sure that your APIs are consistent uh, is your responsibility. Um, and, and by the way, if, if somebody in the audience now thinks, hey, I have seen this slide before, that's right, because this is uh, these slides here are part of the presentation of Yeko and Waldo uh, last week on uh, at uh, NavTech Day. So uh, thanks to them, uh, to Waldo, that I could borrow them. Um, the versioning on uh, uh, APIs is important. You should never break an existing version. Um, instead of that, you need to create new versions of an API if you have any change. Um, so uh, that does mean that you literally take a copy of an existing API and then set a new version on the version property. Um, what happens if you have a complete set of API pages? Let's say you have 10 pages and uh, you want to create a new version only for three of the 10 pages. Then uh, you don't have to, uh, uh, to copy 10 pages and only modify three 
and the other seven uh, will only have uh, a new version number. You can just uh, on the existing uh, seven uh, unchanged uh, API pages, you can add uh, the version because one API page can be existing in multiple versions. So that API page will then be available for both versions. So you only have to uh, uh, to add uh, or to change or copy the, the API pages that really uh, require a change. Um, in your um, uh, API page, you should always include uh, the system ID. It's recommended to have the, uh, the last modified date time, and you should always uh, use camel caching in the naming of the fields. That's uh, kind of a standard in, in, in APIs. And with uh, table relationships and complex types and the whole uh, modification insertion behavior, uh, make sure it is consistent across the, uh, the APIs. Something you uh, need to implement yourself. Do you want to work with APIs, for example, on, uh, on temporary tables or not? Uh, are you going to implement your own code to, to insert it from uh, uh, temporary to the real table? Uh, these kind of things. Uh, it, it's all up to you, but make sure it is consistent across your API pages. Now, the basics. Um, APIs are OData, and APIs can be developed as a page and a query. So uh, we can create a page uh, with page type API, and we can also create a query with query type API, uh, which is different. Uh, and I will show you uh, the difference between those because uh, the query type API, it's much more like a, a real data set um, uh, instead of a nested data set. So um, in your um, uh, API properties that you have to specify, you have the three uh, properties, API publisher, API group, and API version. And those three make up your complete URL to that uh, particular uh, set of, uh, of APIs. So um, they go to the uh, URL um, uh, slash, and then the publisher name slash the group slash the version. Um, so you see here a complete URL where uh, for the standard APIs, you would have API slash V1. For your custom APIs, it's slash publisher, slash group, slash version that you specify. The other thing that you need to add is the um, entity set name and entity name. Normally, um, uh, the, the entity set name is the plural and the uh, entity name is the single name uh, that you use. Um, and be careful, these entity names and the set name is uh, case sensitive, where the API publishing group and version is not case sensitive. Um, so you add them to the end here, you see the items go to the end of, well, again, the companies in between. Don't forget about the company's ID, otherwise it's not going to work. Um, as for the table um, uh, entity that uh, you provide, Think about that uh, system ID field. It is a virtual field. You don't have to create it. You don't have to maintain it, but you should put it on the API page and uh, make sure a uh, primary uh, OData key field. Um, and that is a, a setting. Uh, I will uh, show you that again. Um, I think it was on one of the previous slides already. Uh, put, uh, go back, go back, go back here. Here you see um, uh, that uh, OData key fields uh, on, on the left screenshot, OData key fields is system ID. Um, and then in the, um, uh, in the repeater, you see the first field, which is ID. And you can see that the ID is the system ID. And this is how you should do it, because then every record will have a, a unique identifier, which you can use in the, in the URL. Um, then um, it's recommended to uh, to have a last modified date time uh, in uh, in your records of in your uh, uh, result set. Um, it is possible to uh, uh, to include uh, the primary key and even allow to uh, to rename it with an API if you want to. 
um, because the system ID uh, uh, will survive the rename operation. You can change it uh, uh, on the record. Uh, fields uh, should follow the naming conventions um, on, on APIs. The fields in the table, just the normal naming conventions, but in your uh, API, you give them the name uh, uh, of the, the field with camel casing, removing all the spaces, uh, reading characters, etc. Um, so I think it's, yeah. So here, uh, the field names in the page, uh, you don't have to set application area, it works without. And the name property of the field defines how the field is referenced in the request. So uh, that, is, that is an important part. I will indicate that uh, in my next demo as well. And um, again, make sure your modified behavior works with uh, system ID and uh, remember primary key fields uh, uh, can be changed if you want to, but then you must do uh, a, a rename in your code. Uh, it's not automatically done with the, uh, with the page API itself. So if there is a rename, you want to allow a rename, then uh, make sure to implement uh, a rename in, uh, in the code. Um, some useful resources uh, about uh, um, APIs and how to work with uh, uh, APIs. Let's go on with um, some demo about uh, uh, custom APIs. So what I do have here is a custom API that I've created. I have a custom API um, uh, with um, an entity set name items and entity name item, um, and only it contains number, description, and uh, inventory. Um, so if I publish this, and I go to my uh, custom APIs, then I have my same uh, base URL, but now followed by API AJK demo. Click on uh, send request, and I, I get a complete list of uh, um, API endpoints uh, that are APIs that I have available on this particular endpoint. So if I would publish this with uh, another group or another version, I have to uh, uh, change my URL, of course. So um, as you can see, companies is uh, also part of it uh, that you don't have to, uh, to publish yourself. It will automatically be added uh, to, the, um, uh, to that uh, URL because companies always needs to be part of your uh, URL. So it's automatically available for you. Now I do have um, uh, this one here, the items tool, I've called uh, named it. And here you see uh, ID, number, description, inventory. So uh, that is my custom API. Um, I've also created a, um, a query, as you see here. So this is a query with query type API. I've called it uh, inventory. And the idea is that it uh, combines the item ledger entries. Maybe not the best example in terms of um, um, uh, performance, but um, okay, it's a demo. So what you will see in the result of, of, of this data set that it will not have any nested data. If I call this uh, inventory thing, then you will see the, come on, I was waiting for inventory, there it is. Oh. I have to wait uh, for a couple of uh, seconds. As you can see here, uh, item number is repeated. Um, and, and, and here we have different document numbers. So uh, what happens here is uh, that the data set is more like, uh, uh, yeah, I would say uh, an Excel sheet where uh, uh, you have, um, uh, let's say multiple uh, uh, records uh, with repeating data on, on several uh, lines, because uh, somewhere down uh, the columns, there is another column that does have a, a, a different value. So instead of nesting it, it's a building up uh, a, a real data set of, uh, of data with your query API. Now in my um, um, custom API, I have um, also, uh, 
this is my custom API. I've also built in a, uh, a bound action. So what I want to uh, tell about bound actions, here you have an example, which is um, the one that I demonstrated. Um, and in my next demo, I will do a custom uh, bound action. Um, this, this is a screenshot from the uh, standard API version one. Uh, and here you see a function on the, uh, on the API page, which is uh, service enabled. Um, and the uh, procedure ship and invoice now becomes uh, 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 an endpoint on sales orders slash Microsoft dot nav dot ship and invoice. Uh, uh, mind the first character of the uh, function. Uh, it doesn't work if I do uh, a, a capital S on ship and invoice. It's automatically corrected uh, when this one is published. So um, uh, if, if if you try that with capital S, you will uh, get an error message and then you uh, can really uh, start figuring out what was going on, what's wrong here. It uh, can take you a while uh, until you find out how uh, it was automatically corrected. So um, what I do have on my uh, custom API uh, here is, uh, no, that is my items tool. Where is my items tool? Is this one. Uh, so here I have an, an entity set uh, name items two, and here I have the same thing, uh, a service enabled uh, procedure uh, with procedure set description. Of course, I can do it with a patch uh, call, but it is just for a demo, of course. Um, and what I do is I just set the description uh, on uh, on this record. I don't have to uh, to get the record. But what I need is uh, the value as an input. And that is what I wanted to demonstrate uh, that a, a bound action, uh, unlike the, uh, the example from Microsoft, where it does not work with any input uh, value, this one works with an input value. So uh, here uh, in my um, uh, a function call, I have a value and I set it to Athens desk key, but it was just uh, the demo uh, demo uh, item. So let's get the items and see what happens. Um, this is Athens desk. This is my uh, item ID that I have uh, here in this variable. Now, if I call this function, I get 200 OK. It will not give me the updated item. It will return the updated item, uh, item in a location header, which is part of the code that I uh, did in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the in the action code. But if I call this here again, you will nice now see that this one is uh, renamed to demo item. So um, with that uh, bound call, I have uh, uh, put in a value, which is the name of, uh, of this parameter. Uh, of course, it should match the name of the parameter and that value. Um, I have two other um, uh, tips for you before we go to the Q&A. Um, one is the, uh, a question that I sometimes get from uh, people. Hey, uh, we can get uh, a list of um, uh, companies, but how do we get a list of environments? Um, yeah. And that is uh, uh, something that Microsoft uh, will document uh, uh, pretty soon. Uh, but here you get already that uh, that URL that you can use, uh, apibusinesscentral.dynamics.com slash environments slash v1.0. Uh, if you call that one, uh, it, you get a list of uh, available environments. In this case, I have a production and a sandbox environment. There's only uh, one thing that you uh, uh, should remember when you call this one. You always have to use OAuth authentication. You cannot use this with uh, username password authentication because uh, username password is only bound to one particular uh, uh, environment and you want to be uh, above that level, you want to have all environments. And then you have uh, the only possibility is to, to uh, authenticate as an um, uh, Azure Active Directory user. Um, another thing that I want to um, 
uh, tell you is something about unbound actions. So I've, I've demonstrated bound actions, but it's also possible to um, uh, to work with unbound actions, and that they come from a code unit that is published as a web service. You uh, in in the web services list you only see uh, the SOAP URL, but in fact you can also call that code unit with a REST URL, which is officially not supported. So uh, you might think Microsoft is going to uh, remove that uh, feature uh, in, the, in, in the future because they're still not uh, convinced that it is useful. But uh, it is already used by the Power Automate uh, templates uh, with Flow. So um, I'm, I'm really quite convinced they uh, will not just remove that possibility because otherwise uh, uh, those flows that are using uh, approvals uh, just will fail in uh, in the future. So uh, I think it's it's gonna um, uh, be here for a while. Um, how does that look like? Uh, I have an, uh, a simple code unit here uh, with a function called uh, ping and get current day time, capitalize, uh, etc. And this one is published with a, um, a normal web service publishing uh, XML. So it ends up in your web services list as a published uh, uh, code unit with the name my unbound actions. Now, if I go to my uh, API list here, um, I think it is here, then um, the only difference is from the normal APIs that I have to call this with OData v4 instead of API. Um, with this, uh, I get a, a, a list of, uh, of, of companies and um, let's call that, that ping uh thing so um to, to show you what is happening in that one uh ping just says exit pong um and if i call the ping command i do that with odata v4 slash nav dot the name of the uh, published code unit the web service name underscore function name i call I click on that one and i get back the pong as a result um I can ask for other uh, uh, data types like uh, uh, daytime values. Um, I can ask for uh, a function. This one does have an input uh, parameter. As you can see here, capitalize does have an input. So I just exit that with input to upper. And I call that one. And here we have that value. So again, the code unit is working here. I have another one that says get current company because um, in your complete URL, you did not specify any company. So I return my current name of the, uh, uh, the current company, which is empty because I have not specified any company. So my last demo, and then I open up for Q&A, is to get the first uh, customer name from uh, the, the, the record customer. And this one will fail and will tell us that we have to choose a company before we can access the customer table. And there is a simple solution uh, for that because we can just add a, a custom header company with the company ID. And now if I send the request, I will have the name of that record. So um, that's my final demo was also my final slide. I talked for almost 60 minutes, I think, 55 minutes. So um, are there any questions? Yeah, excellent. Thanks very much, AJ. Um, we, yeah, we do have a question. Um, do you know anything about when or if Microsoft is going to make it possible to use custom APIs in the Power Platform? Um, that is already possible by means of uh, creating custom connectors. So custom APIs, uh, if you want to do that uh, in the Power Platform, you also have to create a custom connector because the standard connector in the Power Platform uh, uh, is only uh, containing a, a wide list of uh, selected APIs and web services. But with custom connectors, you can, uh, you, you completely own the place, you can do anything. 
Great. And uh, watch your Tech Day session when it's available on YouTube for more about more about custom connectors. <laughs> I don't know. You you should ask uh, uh, Luke about that. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, yeah. Well, uh, it takes uh, a couple of days, I guess. Uh, they're working on it. Uh, I, it should be available in one or two weeks at the most. Okay, that's that's the only question from the group. One one from me, if you, if you don't mind. Um, you mentioned at the start about um, replacing soap code units with REST, uh, and mm -hmm. you've demonstrated that at the end. Um, what other benefits do you think of using REST for code units over SOAP? Well, um, uh, I can think of um, specific scenarios where you want to uh, not to work on a particular record. Uh, for example, uh, I have um, uh, created a code unit to uh, create a new company and import uh, one of the predefined um, uh, uh, data, data sets that you can uh, apply. Um, for that, um, I've just created a code unit that, 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 that does that for me, uh, and I can call a code unit uh, with a REST call, just as an example. So uh, it's, it's, it's really for non-bound uh, actions that you want to do. Yeah. Great. Uh, I suppose we're going to make this the last question. Is it possible to create custom EDMs? Uh, yes, it is possible to do so. Um, it's not easy, uh, as in uh, it's quite some work. But uh, yes, uh, you need to go with the uh, EDM table. There is a specific table for that, and I believe uh, Vieco wrote uh, a blog post about that uh, about a year ago. Uh, so you should really go to uh, vieco.com and, and read his blog post about it. Uh, I, I think it still works the same, uh, which is basically uh, adding a record to that uh, EDM uh, uh, table. Uh, you specify how uh, the EDM custom type looks like, uh, implement some functions to compose it, and that should work. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much uh, for sharing your knowledge with us today, AJ. Uh, lots for us to, to think about, and uh, we'll draw things to a close there. Thanks everyone for attending. Okay, you're and, uh, very much welcome. Okay, cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.